Good afternoon, I should say, for most of you. Um, thank you very much for having me. I will be talking today a little bit about the social side of conservation and in particular, people who are volunteering in conservation. So Stian just gave you a little brief introduction there, um, a few more details about me. I'm a, working at the University of Guelph. I'm a social scientist by training and a human ecologist, and I work on the human dimensions of fisheries. So in, during my PhD, I worked in Norway, Wales, and Germany on voluntary hatchery programs there. Here in Canada, I'm working on commercial fisheries in the Great Lakes and with several First Nations on their cultivation work. And I also do some work on the hatchery program in the state of Alaska, which is quite substantial. Um, I really enjoy talking with other people about these topics. So if you have any interest in what you hear today, please do get in touch with me. Email or social media works just as well for me. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention here the Coastal Roots Project. This is my current project and uh, it's a Canadian funded effort to look at resilience and the, the qualities that make coastal communities resilient around Canada and other parts of North America. And we've since expanded into Alaska, Maine, Scotland, and Norway. We produce a podcast through this project that I think might be of interest to some people if you like fisheries topics. Uh, it's called the Social Fish Sensing podcast and it's under the the search coastal roots radio and you can find it on any streaming platform that you normally look for in the podcast we explore the impacts of COVID-19 on coastal fisheries uh, rather small scale fisheries around North America but we also feature stories from other places it is a storytelling podcast so not just bad news and uh, not just kind of long form interviews so today I'd like to talk about the role and the power really of using volunteers in conservation projects. And I'm, I'm speaking more, I think, from the managerial side today um, of, as someone who might be looking to engage with volunteers to support a project that I have in mind. Now, volunteers can do really fantastic things in conservation. Um, as many of, if you've ever worked with a volunteer group, you know that they can bring a free or very inexpensive labor to a project. Um, they can bring a tremendous amount of local knowledge of their area or of a species or of a conservation issue. And they can provide really critical and needed support to paid staff and, and conservation workers. On the flip side of that, however, um, volunteers are, they, they come with some costs, perhaps with some risks. Volunteers can often be uh, rather unskilled when it comes to the job that they are being asked to do in a conservation project. And obviously they have different kinds of skills and maybe they can bring some really high skilled labor, um, but often we find volunteers who are motivated by other things than their skill sets. And so they're, they're there, but they don't really know how to do the skills that we're asking them to do. And because of that, they require then quite a lot of direction or training or supervision, um, which while I think is a reasonable thing to provide, it certainly does take time away from paid staff or, or paid members of the project. There's also the issue that sometimes conservation volunteers, even with good intention, may do more harm than they do good in ecologically sensitive projects. For example, I remember being in Wales and speaking to a conservation manager who was responsible for a project to eliminate um, giant hogsweed, which is a very noxious invasive weed in some parts of the world. And it gives you these really terrible rashes. And they said, you know, I, we get so many volunteers who wanna get rid of this weed, who wanna come and rip it out and along the riverbank, but we almost refuse to use volunteers for this work because if they miss one plant, it undoes all of the work because the plant produces so many seeds. And if, if no one catches it, then you, you have to start all over with that same place the next year. So in that case, they, they preferred to use that really skilled paid labor, even though it was much more expensive than, than using the, the volunteers. And I think because of these different issues, we have to consider that volunteers um, are not just a disposable form of labor, that they need to be recruited and managed ethically and in a way that is not exploitive of their, their good intentions in their labor. Um, and I think they also pre present a challenge because sometimes uh, volunteers really want to only do specific jobs. Um, and we have to, to think a little bit about, is this a good fit between the project that we have in mind and the volunteer? Um, and, and I want to share with you this, this work from Lithgow and Trimbell, Trimbell tri, sorry, Tim, Tim Rell um, from 2014. And this is 
a, a spectrum of thinking when it comes to, or a process of thinking rather, of how to engage with volunteers in conservation work. And I want to draw attention that the first step here on the left is actually to understand the volunteer audience that you have, as opposed to thinking about the needs of the project first. Um, and I think that, you know, in my experience, that's often been the reverse that we say we, oh, we have a project and we know we need some help. So we, we think we'll put some volunteers on that step. But in fact, we're, we're interested in, in, this, in this model and looking at you know, what is available to us and, and what needs do they have? Um, what motivations have brought them to this volunteer work? Um, and in that case, we can think about motivations as well. Um, so this is some more work from Misham and Barnett from 2008. And here they talk about the different motivations that people have that bring them to environmental conservation work. Um, and I think most of this will sound really familiar to people who, on this call who, who do work with volunteers. Um, people come to volunteer work because they really want to make a contribution to their community, or perhaps they really love this particular natural resource and they value it. So they want to do something to give back to it. I think often, for example, with angling clubs, we see this where they, they view their volunteer work as supporting the resource that they enjoy withdrawing from at other points in the year. Um, in Norway, I think this is particularly familiar, but this is true in other places as well, that volunteering makes up uh, a part of a social club. And so they really, the people want to take part in it because they enjoy that opportunity to socialize with other people who are doing similar activities as to what they are doing. And I, I find this to be particularly true of people who are middle-aged and into their retirement years. Now, on the flip side of that, you might find that young people, um, they might enjoy the socialization as well, but they also are looking to develop new skill sets, perhaps in an effort to break into the field of conservation at a professional level, or perhaps just because they're looking for ways to diversify their CV and they'd like to develop some new skills. And this is a, a, a low cost way to be able to do that. Now, of course, you have other people who uh, may, these, these first reasons may apply, but perhaps they just really enjoy the environment, they care about nature, they'd like to contribute, even if they aren't too fussy about what species or what plant or, or what activity they're doing. Um, and then, of course, people who just love to spend time in working in the outdoors. Um, they, and these are people you find typically in more practical types of volunteering. Maybe they're looking for exercise, maybe just an excuse to get out of the house. Um, again, probably don't have a lot of involvement in what type of activity it is. They just like to do something outside. So keeping these motivations in mind, um, that's, I think this is, this is critical that when we recruit people in an ethical way to participate in conservation that we're thinking about what is it that they want out of this experience? What, what brings them to this table? And how can we make sure that they walk away with some of these experiences after the work is finished? So now I'd like to give an example of some of these, these principles in practice. And this comes from my PhD work, as I mentioned, working with hatcheries and volunteer hatchery groups in Norway um, and also Wales and Germany. And when we think about the question of how can we conserve salmon, there are several answers to that question, um, depending on, of course, where you are and, and what is appropriate in that area. Hatcheries and stocking have been for, you know, for over a century in some places, uh, a very popular way to address this question. And so people have gotten quite good at this work. They, they've developed strong communities around doing these types of activities. And they have uh, quite a lot of volunteer spirit and effort involved in making sure that these salmon are put back into the water and, and are able to hopefully survive and, and return to be caught or return to reproduce later. But we also have other answers to this question, how can we conserve salmon? And especially in more recent decades, the answer has been, well, let's work on the habitat. Let's see what we can do to improve the habitat that's already there so that any existing salmon population can be more successful without uh, such a, a high degree of human intervention like you might see with the stocking. And in both of these questions, uh, or rather in both of these solutions to this question, it's important to consider that not every conservation activity, even if it has a similar outcome for the conservation goal, it may not have a similar outcome for the activities that the people are doing, for the benefits that the person who is doing the work are, is able to get. And that's something that we found in, in this research that I was a part of, <clears throat> excuse me, 
is that hatcheries produce a very different type of ben uh, series of benefits than say an angling program might or just habitat restoration might. Um, and we found that there's, you can break these into three categories of benefit, um, psychological benefits, which occur kind of in the mind at the individual level. Um, and this can be um, feeling quite closely that you personally identify with being a, someone who takes care of fish. Um, maybe it's a break from your normal routine um, with your family or with your friends or with your work. And so this is a nice thing that you get to do that enriches your day-to-day -day life. Um, we also found their social benefits, and these are the benefits that kind of occur at the group level. So these are people who are rather these are benefits that occur. Um, so people getting to spend time with their peers, spending time with people who have something in common with them, for example, interest in the river or in the salmon, um, and an opportunity to network and to pass on skills from one generation to another. And then, of course, we also have the benefits that occur at the conservation level, right? So the different types of stock monitoring, um, perhaps some habitat improvement that might come along as a secondary part to the, hat the hatchery work, um, monitoring for invasive species, all of these different things that, that actually do achieve the conservation goal, but that are really one of three different types of benefits that we see from that work. And one thing we found that was a bit surprising in this work is that these benefits are all linked together. So you can't really just say, well, let's just put a different activity in. Let's say we don't want to do stocking anymore, or we as the conservation organization would like to move away from stocking and from hatchery work. Um, let's, let's just give some people something else to work on. We find that you can't do that. You have to, these things are all linked together and they co-occur, meaning that the production of salmon um, being the centerpiece draws these social benefits, but then those social benefits help drive the psychological benefits and, and vice versa. So it's important that we realize that they're linked together and we treat them as a system, a whole, a holistic system as, sorry, as opposed to uh, something that we can just substitute in and out. So when we go back to this question, we still have this challenge, how do we conserve salmon? And as managers, we might have strong preferences on how volunteers take part in, in this activity and in the conservation of salmon. And if we have one activity, but we would like people to move to a different activity, um, how do we achieve that? How can we, how can we do, make sure that in an ethical way, people are bringing the skill sets, the knowledge, all of the wonderful things that they do bring to the table? Um, and, the, and that serve the motivations that originally got them into the work. How can we transfer that into something that perhaps is more aligned with the conservation goals that we have today? Um, and this is where I think that the things that I addressed earlier really are critical to appreciate that we understand the motivations that brought people to the project and we understand the benefits that they are getting from that project so that we can think about what is it about habitat improvement uh, what activities could we ask people to do within the habitat improvement um, circle that achieve those similar things from stocking? And I have, a, I guess, a small suggestion for that, and that is um, incremental change. So a slow and steady shifting of the baseline of expectation and of practices that go into conservation. And here I have uh, j a, just a small suggestion that addresses the former question, how to conserve salmon. You know, this is an egg box. This is, a, 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 if you're unfamiliar, a box that you put the salmon eggs in the top and then there's a, a bit of a mesh in the middle of the box where when the salmon hatch, they can go down to the lower part. Um, they do all of this without human intervention. The only part where the human plays the role is in collecting the gametes, um, the reproductive material from the salmon, doing the fertilization, and then uh, perhaps they'll sit in an incubator for a little while and then they go into this box. So the salmon, um, is, is born directly into the river environment and never sees the hatchery environment, even though we do overcome some life stage bottlenecks by protecting the eggs this way and protecting those original, those rather those juvenile fry um, as they emerge and are, are starting to consume their egg sac. So this is a photograph of, of me here in Norway um, working with uh, the Veterinary Institute or, or staff from the Veterinary Institute to plant some of these egg boxes in a river um, that formerly had the gyrodactylus parasite and had been treated. And now they are trying to, to bring back the genetic subpopulations that were native to this river. So 
I think this this is a, a way that we can consider what different activities can our volunteers do. So they can still do some of the hatchery work in this case. They, they still get to enjoy the social benefits that come from working together in that hatchery. But instead of the po perhaps possibly negative impacts that act the actual rearing of fish in a hatchery may have on the, the eventual life history of the fish, we can now have volunteers digging holes, planting boxes, uh, monitoring the hatching, monitoring the red uh, or the nest of the salmon, and making sure that that the, the fish do have a success, hopefully, in, in moving on in their lives. Uh, is this a perfect solution in every place? Absolutely not. Every, every conservation context is unique, and these questions should be asked in each place um, so that the answers are relevant to those people and to that context. Um, but I do think that this slow approach, rather than saying, okay, no more hatcheries, or okay, um, no more conservation, uh, rather no more habitat improvement using this method, that we make those gradual incremental changes instead and allow people to adapt, to adjust, and to bring all of the great things that they do offer to a project with them into new skills and new activities as much as possible. So uh, Susan talked very much for having me. I appreciate uh, being invited to attend today. I hope that this gives you just a, a small glance into some of the social considerations of uh, this type of conservation work. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, we don't have any questions right now, but do type, uh, I can start with one. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that, um, Say if uh, if you change from hatcheries to say habitat improvement, which we're talking about today, um, that there would be different benefits or maybe benefits not valued quite as high as the former activity. Uh, but um, if you change from hatcheries to emphasizing habitat restoration, uh, could you also get like may, there might be a different type of people that would come in? Because what we're seeing, for instance, up in Vardal, uh, those, say, volunteering and coming along with us, electrofishing and etc., I would not describe them as, they're not typically salmon anglers. Or, that, or they, they are different. They are, they live by a small stream. Uh, yeah, just particularly interested in, well, nature conservation, stuff like that. It's different people. Yeah, I, that's a great question. So, and I would I would remind the audience then back to the slide where I showed the the long series of steps, and that we need to think about who is available, uh, who is our audience in our conservation. So, if we know that we want to move to habitat improvement, we need to think about our volunteer audience. Are these people who are willing to do that work? Um, are there different people in the community who, as you say, uh, might be more interested in habitat work than they would be in hatchery work for whatever reason? Um, that it's very possible that we might find a different group that could that could be the lead or could be the core of the the conservation volunteer effort toward something like habitat conservation. Um, and I think that's that's excellent. It's always nice to be able to draw in new groups of people and build more of that conservation ethic within a community. Um, but uh, I don't want to dwell too much on conflict in this case, but, but this can also be a source of conflict, right? So if you have, as a, as a manager or as an organization previously worked with one group, and now you're saying, well, this work that you like to do is no longer something we're willing to support, we're moving this new direction. And if you're not willing to come with us, we'll find someone new. That can sometimes lead to some hard feelings, I think. <laughs> so, so again, I think um, certainly great to always find new people in a community who want to do the work to increase your knowledge base, increase your skill base, but recognizing that you may be inadvertently creating um, someone who's going to now speak poorly of those efforts. So you, it's, I think, useful to try and bring along as many people as you can. But of course, not everyone will always want to make those transitions. And, and that's also part of life and okay, I think. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's a great comment. And also that, for instance, up in Marl, we kind of like started on scratch. There was, uh, I mean, we didn't switch from hatchery to doing the streams. And, uh, but I guess that's something you, you really need to have in mind. Indeed. And, and sometimes we want to do big projects in places where we don't have a big volunteer base. And so we need in, in that ethical thinking around what are we offering to volunteers? Are we asking them to do 
kind of commit way too much time and effort than, than what is possible in a place. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, it's complicated more so than maybe we realize, but not necessarily in a negative way, but just in a way that requires perhaps a bit more planning at the beginning of projects that we know we want to use volunteers. Yeah. See, no questions coming in here. Okay, well, thank you very much, Hannah. I know you need to rush soon to a I different do. appointment, but I was really glad that we were able to have you here this morning for you. Yes, and thank you so much. This is lovely. It's nice to, to be back in Norway for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah.